Hi, and welcome to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Today, we're going to be speaking about some things that aren't so pleasant because they're invasive. We're going to talk about invasive species. And we're speaking with invasive species specialist Dana Laxton from York Region. Um, invasive species, we will say right off the bat, we're not talking about alien species. We're not talking about species from another planet. We're actually talking about species from our own planet that are invasive because they shouldn't be here. Well, here at this spot. And we're speaking sort of about the York Regional Forest, and obviously that's, you can't just narrow things down just to only the York Regional Forest. But this is a Stovall Community Radio Station, so we will be speaking specifically about our area, although this does apply to many areas in Ontario. Good morning, Dana. Thanks for joining us on Fresh Waves. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, we'd like to talk to you today about invasive species. Yes, uh, not uh, the most positive topic, of course, but I think very important for for people to be aware um, just what invasive species are in Ontario and uh, our community and how uh, they might impact uh, even just our, our day-to-day lives, really. Yeah, it's it's funny. I've always said you can't fault someone for not knowing what they don't know. And about 10 years ago, a friend of mine said to me, oh, if you just need some ground cover for your north side of the house, and I back on to the York Regional Forest, if you just need some ground cover, I've got this great purple flower, and it just takes over the garden, but it's so pretty. And she gave me a pot. I planted it on the north side. I can happily say that for some reason it didn't grow, but it was periwinkle. Mm, Yes. And you don't know if you don't know. (laughs) Exactly. And honestly, I think uh, it's it's still evolving. People's awareness of sort of plants to avoid, if you will, is, is definitely has increased most recently. Um, knowledge wise, uh, I'm seeing a lot of, you know, like online social media uh, groups advocating for increased awareness of, of plants to avoid. Um, and, you know, Lots of great information sharing at sort of a grassroots community gardening sort of level, um, but yeah, we're we're sort of suffering um, at the hands of of gardeners, let's say from the seventies and eighties, not knowing, uh, you know, and and even the horticultural industry not knowing what they were selling um, would have negative impacts on uh, people's private properties, and then uh, as a result, our natural areas. Well, it's hard to envision that a little plant growing close to the ground with pretty leaves and a pretty little flower can be so aggressive. (laughs) Yeah, it's, you know, and this is the thing, there are people still to this day as well that you're not going to change their mind. You could show them pictures, you could tell them all of the negative ecological impacts that this plant might be having to our natural areas, um, and they're not going to change their gardening ways. But I think there's a huge movement um, like I said, even just within the last few years of native plant gardening for a reason, I think people are starting to understand the detrimental impacts that some of these uh, popular landscape uh, plants um, have had and, and are continuing to have. Um, and so there is a huge movement, I would say. It's lovely to see. Um, but yeah, we're still going to have people that are going to advocate for uh, invasive ground covers such as periwinkle or goutweed. Goutweed comes in the variegated form, which is the white and green mix that re- was really popular in the 80s um, and into the se- late 70s. There's so many, like I can't even keep track of them. There's ones that come in sort of like hanging flower baskets and things, and then people throw the flower baskets when they're done at the end of the season over the fence into the ravine behind their house. And there's some really aggressive ground covers that um, have been coming out of those that we're starting to learn about. I think one of them is called bugleweed. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I've got a house on my street here uh, where the whole front yard um, is intermixed bugleweed and grass. Um, they just mow it like grass. They don't know any different, um, but the bugleweed is spread that much out of a garden is going right across their lawn. Hmm. I think that's what's happening with my lawn with this creeping Charlie or something. That yes, creeping Charlie is another one, and creeping Jenny is that nice, bright sort of yellow. Um, again, very popular in you know hanging baskets and things like that. Well, the thing is, I mean, I can grab one end of the creeping Charlie and start to pull, 
and pull and pull and pull and I just never seem to come to the end of it. Yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting. It just is a runner. It, it just sort of sets down these little tiny roots as it goes and it just turns into one giant network of plants. It's, it's actually it fascinating to see, but you, yeah, can't, so. you can't get rid of it. You can't find the beginning and you can't find the end. Yeah, it, it's really good at weaving its way through grass and ultimately um, crowding, overcrowding the grass. So you do end up losing that lawn look um, mm-hmm. and feel and you end up with just pure creeping Charlie over time. Wow. Well, my dad warned me against it about 12 years ago, and I said to him, you know what, I want to have, I don't want a lawn per se, I'm in the forest, I want more like a clearing and a meadow, and that's what I'm going for. Oh, anyway, mm-hmm. it sort of didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some so, backfiring there. Can you give us an idea of some examples of some common things that are really invasive and interfering with the forest and the forests around right now? Yeah, so we spoke of periwinkle, and I can say, um, you know, that is one that we've seen creeping into the forest. Um, We have some neighboring properties to some of our forest tracks that have let periwinkle creep, and it has shown up creeping through our forest floor, unfortunately. Um, Goutweed I've seen. uh, We've also got a lot of dog strangling vine, unfortunately, and honestly, I think dog strangling vine is one of my, uh, I guess I would say, number one least favorite invasive species um dog strangling vine it's not really as common of of a of a garden plant so you wouldn't necessarily see people well i know for certain it's not for sale because it is a regulated species under the invasive species act but um so you're not going to buy it at a garden center but people will have it on their properties and not know what it is and then it just keeps spreading and spreading and because it's in the milkweed family um, its uh, seed pods are very similar to milkweed. They're just a lot more slender and tiny. They kind of look like a hot Thai pepper, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but they they will bur- burst open, and they have those same um, fluffy floating seeds as milkweed does. Uh, and so that's one of the main ways that it travels so far and can end up in the middle of a forest, for instance. Um, but yeah, it also spreads by underground root systems. So it's very difficult to control um, because of just how much uh, root growth there is under the soil. So you could mow it, um, which does help keep it at bay, but it really requires consistent, constant mowing. And of course, we're not going to be able to do that in a forest ecosystem. That's not something that that's feasible. So um, unfortunately, it loves pine plantations. And with the history of Wishart Stouffville and the Oak Ridges Moraine uh, and the early settlement in that area with the sandy soils, um, with a lot of the, the properties that have pine plantations, such as the York Regional Forest and many private properties, uh, it has this sort of perfect storm for dog strangling vine. It, dog strangling vine spreads quite happily in the understory of, of these forest types. I think it's because of the amount of sunlight it's able to get. Um, and as it spreads, it literally strangles everything up to, you know, over two meters above ground. So I've seen lots of saplings in the future forest essentially be threatened by dog strangling vine. I have it on my property and I can say that it is the bane of my existence. (laughs) I hate it. And I've been trying now for five years, diligently going out and cutting it back in the garden. Every time I see it, I don't pull it because I, I've heard that if you pull it, you actually make the original root stronger or something so i cut Um, it and i cut it and i cut it and it still keeps coming back (laughs) yeah it's tough so really you've got to look at plants as um little solar panels and we need to cut those little solar panels off because otherwise the solar panels keep harvesting energy to feed the root systems um, keeping the plant alive so when i say mowing i mean like mowing it like you would a golf green you don't want the plant to have any above ground biomass because it's going to keep fueling those roots. Um, so I've seen people, you know, on roads that say there's dog strangling vine in the in the road right of way or the beside the road or the, the the ditch out front of their house. Those that are mowing their ditch and keeping their lawn very manicured from that perspective don't have dog strangling vine. But the people that opt for a more wild natural um, ravine or ditch uh, have a lot of dogs generally fine. So the mowing does seem to work. Um, There is, you know, mixed information out there on the pulling um, and the digging. It all depends really on how much you have 
and how realistic it is for you to try and get as much um, out of the ground. Uh, you really need to to get the what they call sort of the root crown, if you will. You'll see if you if you dig down or you pull up um, as much of the plant as possible. It has this like root crown that has sort of buds, and it. it's the future uh, extra vines that are going to come up. If you get a lot of that and get a lot of the roots, um, and you do it religiously um, every you know few weeks, every month or so to prevent growth, you should have, um, you know, success with removing it. It just takes perseverance. And that's honestly what, what I say to a lot of landowners and residents is that you can do it if you have the physical means, but you do have to stay on top of it. Yeah, because it seems like every time I yank it out, it just grows back in a week. There it is again. (laughs) Yeah, it's honestly perseverance. (laughs) And it does wrap around things, even little decorative sort of junipers and things in the garden it just wraps around and around and around it's ridiculous it really is so aggressive it is it's very aggressive so what i kind of say with most um invasive plants is the key is to not let it go to seed either so um you want to stop that additional mode of spread um and i find these plants all have a time of season where they're the most vulnerable and so what that means is with dog string lean vine, you've got the plant growing above the ground um, and it starts to produce this sort of uh, burgundy red flower, purple flower. And then it starts to put all of its energy into seed pods. And it's at that point in time when you've got the, the flowers and the, the young seed pods, that's when the least amount of energy is stored in the root system. It's put so much above ground. So that's when it's the most um, vulnerable and that's the best time to, to yank it out of the ground. Hmm. And so in that point, you could actually just yank it and you're not going to strengthen the root. Yeah, I'd, like it's it's tough. It There's so many different, as we call them, best practices. It's really site by site basis. You've just got to know how much plant you have. Um, general rule of thumb with invasive plants is they love disturbance. So that's why initially there's been a lot of communications about don't dig, don't pull because you're disturbing the soil. But if it's if all that you have is dog strangling vine in that area, then just go at it and get as much out as possible and stay on top of it. And then, you know, once you know you've, say, you've rid yourself of 95% of it, then you could go in and put, plant something else or, or seed, overseed or something like that. But don't expect it to not pop up again. You've always got to keep your eyes out for it. Yeah. It's just like the... So there is hope. Yeah. There is hope. <laughs> As I'm trying to say there is hope, but it does take a lot of effort. Well, there's one garden that has so much in it that I think I might just actually dig up that whole garden space. You know, it's probably six feet by 10 feet, and I'm just going to dig up the whole area because I'm sick and tired of the dog strangling vine. I can't get rid of it. Yeah, constantly popping up. Um, Yeah, it's, it's again, like I said, I think the key is uh, prevent the establishment. So that's why we try at York Region and through our partners um, at the Invasive Species Centre and the Invading Species Awareness Program and Ontario Invasive Plant Council is to always have information out there to increase awareness of what these plants look like, how to identify them, and to do something about them early to prevent them from becoming established on your property and then causing you so much grief and heartache down the road. Yeah, I also don't want to be one of those people that is contributing to an invasive species that is getting into the public forest. I mean, I am theoretically a number of houses down from from the forest, but I know how things spread. And when I watch the how the dog strangling vine spreads, and it seems to get bigger and bigger every year, then, you know, you do have to keep on top of these things and you want to be a responsible citizen. <laughs> Yeah, and you know what? That's a great point. It's we we do rely on communication, so education and outreach, and, and increasing awareness, and having you know um, our you know our neighbors appreciate and um, and want to be good stewards and, and neighbors of the forest. Um, but vice versa, like we have the plants on our property in a lot of cases, and we're trying. You know, we can't. We have hundreds of, of hectares of land. And we're not able to necessarily control all the plants on on every square inch of our properties either. So, you know, it is like 
we, we can't expect our neighbors to be perfect because we're not going to be perfect because it's realistically, it's everyone's problem. Um, mm-hmm. But I think when, you know, we were talking about don't, don't be like us with dog strangling vine on your property, avoid this plan at all costs. I think that's the best, you know, the best way we can go at it at this point. Now, through my dog strangling vine, I actually followed it that was strangling something. And I thought, oh, isn't this interesting? I didn't know I had wild grapes. And I thought, no, hang on a second. I don't have wild grapes. And I used my little plant identification app and I've got buckthorn. Ah, What the heck is buckthorn? I've never heard of it before. Yeah, so buckthorns, we've got two uh, species of European buckthorn, uh, glossy buckthorn and European buckthorn in, or common buckthorn, I should say, in Ontario. Um, I wouldn't worry about which one of the two. They're both equally uh, frustrating um, and bad. Uh, so buckthorn is a, a woody shrub that can actually get quite tall into almost like a small tree. Um, it uh, obviously is from Europe, so it's not supposed to be here. Uh, and it creates, um, well, it spreads by a number of ways. And that's one thing with invasive species period is they tend to be quite uh, prolific and, and have different modes of spread. So that's what makes them so successful. Um, and so buckthorn has berries. It has attractive purple berries that unfortunately our native bird species like to eat. Um, but uh, it's actually, uh, actually upsets their stomachs. So it goes through them quite quickly and thus uh, they help spread the seeds um, to properties all over the place. So um, yeah, there's that mode of, of spread, but it also uh, it's allelopathic, which is a fancy word for um, it has an ability to sort of change the soil chemistry around it to make it more desirable for its own uh, seeds to germinate and make it, let's say almost toxic um, and undesirable for a lot of our native tree seeds and an underground species. So it helps kind of itself spread that way as well. Um, and so it, it grows quite often, you know, along hedgerows. It, it's not super shade tolerant. So you're going to see it along forest edges, um, farmers fields, uh, wind rows, things like that, standalone, you know, uh, in a park or a green space. Um, and so, yeah, there, and unfortunately buckthorn is, ugh, it's everywhere. It's very widespread. It's, it's been here for many years. So it's, you know, just got that population. Mm-hmm. That and I wasn't aware of it. So it grew and it's, it was like a tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I had one, I had one and then I followed it, kind of looked around and then took that down and realized I had another and then another and then another and we burn them all, but um, it, it again, if you don't know, you don't know. And I guess it's been there for years. Obviously, it has. And I didn't even notice it. But all of them were, like you said, leaning out into the open area. Yep. And uh, that's the unfortunate thing. It's another thing of just people not knowing what some of these sort of the worst of the worst, if you will. And buckthorn is definitely up there. Yeah, isn't that something? So I guess an invasive species is just something that is not supposed to be here. So how do they get here in the first place? Yeah, well, mostly humans, unfortunately, we're the ones to blame. Um, a big part of it is uh, international commerce, right? And people people moving between continents every day um, and countries and provinces. And so, yeah, nature and, and um, invasive species know no political boundary. Um, and unfortunately, you know, people thinking that, you know, they're bringing a harmless plant or seeds or... Um, even just, you know, something that might have the tiniest microorganism in some residual soil on a vegetable. It's, you know, um, there's, you know, both intentional and unintentional uh, movement of goods that have resulted in all these different species becoming established here in Ontario. In fact, Ontario has over 660 known non-native invasive species that are um, threatening either our environmental health, uh, society's health, and our economy. That's crazy. <laughs> it's mean, not good. No, <laughs> it's not and a it's, stat we, we should be proud of. No, and I, I know people, 
you know, they're bringing a fruit home from wherever they are in the world and they don't think anything of it. But it really is, I guess, all about education so that they understand that these are really not a good thing to do. Yeah, and some invasive species really have a um, like a an unknown history as to the why and how. And then we have ones that, you know, we know were intentionally done by people moving from Europe to North America. So some examples of intentionally introduced invasive species would be garlic mustard and wild parsnip. Both are edible. Both are, you know, were, were very common herb and, and vegetable um, in European countries and people wanted to have those with them here in Canada. And so they brought them over, they started growing them in their backyard, but then they started to spread and people didn't know what they were and they let them spread further and further. And here we are now we've got garlic mustard all over the place. We've got wild parsnip that's just profusely spreading from Eastern Ontario through uh, our area here in York region and, and beyond. Um, and that one poses a direct threat to human health because of the poisonous sap that the plant contains. Hmm. And it's a parsnip. It is. It's a completely edible parsnip um, below ground. So it's the root that's edible, but it's the above ground plant, the green greenery that contains a sap that's um, phytophototoxic. So what that means is that it actually, uh, if you were to break a stem and get a bit of the sap on your skin and it was a sunny day, it, it uh, alters the chemistry with UV light and it actually can result in like second degree burns on your skin and blistering. Very, very painful. Wow, that sounds super nasty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's. I think people have heard of giant hogweed by now. Yes, um, and so it contains the same the same phytophototoxin in its sap. So, as much as the media sort of picked up on giant hogweed and sort of, uh, you know, there's a lot of a bit of fear mongering um, with you know this is this plant's going to chase your children down and blind them mm -hmm. um, without being super dramatic. But that, in a nutshell, is some of the the ways I've seen the the plant portrayed. Um, I would argue that uh, wild parsnips uh, just as bad, if not worse. And I say this because giant hogweed is a little bit more. Uh, isolated. It's not widespread. It likes its feet to be wet. So you're going to find it in more like riparian areas, so stream sides and ditches um, mm -hmm. where people don't often go. Uh, whereas wild parsnip is uh, spreading rampantly through parks, um, green spaces, uh, beside, you know, growing in cracks of sidewalks and besides bus stops and along a road right of ways. So it's much more generalist that way. And um, yeah, it's it's got just as much of, of an issue in terms of the, the health risks. So I would say it's worse. Hmm. Well, it's interesting that you said that because one thing that, I think we should talk about is the fact that in the description of invasive species, there are invasive species like we just talked about that can be really toxic and really bad for you. But there's also a lot of native species that are pretty damn toxic and not so good for you. Either. They're like poison ivy. Poison ivy is a native species, isn't it? It is. Um, yeah. And so, yes, this is this is where terminology can can uh, is important, but also can get confusing quickly. So in my field with working with invasive species, 99% of my work is going to be focused on what we call non native invasive species. So okay. that is, we are talking about the things coming from outside of our province or outside of our country. So they're not native, um, and they are invasive. Um, and so those would be the worst of the worst. Then we have things like just general invasive species, which can employ apply to native species, um, such as poison ivy, where the plant itself or the, or the pest itself has invasive properties, where it can start in certain conditions, it will outcompete a lot of other things and can show that sort of aggressive growth um, and takeover. And that's, you know, in, in by definition, the word invasive. Um, and then, of course, we have native plants that, yes, are meant to be here. Um, and poison ivy is one, and people don't often recognize that, but it does have, um, you know, it does pose a similar health risk. And that's why, again, really, when people are out in nature, um, you need to sort of be aware of some of the hazards that, that are in nature. And whether it's an invasive non-native or our native poison ivy, you should learn and understand what they look like to avoid um, having a, having a run-in with them. 
Mm-hmm. Well, we have to take our first little break here on Fresh Waves. Um, we're talking this morning with Dana Laxton, an invasive species specialist from York Region. And we'll be right back, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm Bren Masson, host of Fresh Waves. If you'd like to hear this broadcast again, why don't you check out our YouTube page, Fresh Waves Radio. You can click subscribe, and then you can hear all of the Fresh Waves podcasts. We love to hear from you as well, so you can contact me at bren at freshwaves.ca. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the show. Hi, we're back on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Today we're speaking with Dana Laxton from York Region. She's an invasive species specialist, and I challenge anyone on a Sunday morning to say that fast three times. And we're talking about invasive species. We were talking before the break about some actually native um, irritants like poison ivy, and now we're going to switch to some bugs. <laughs> Because we have some invasive species that are bugs. We do. Uh, have a, we have more than one, unfortunately. So give us an example of some of the common ones. Well, some that have been around for a while, um, you know, that have sort of their their peak years and then they sort of disappear would be spongy moth um, and Japanese beetle. Those would be two examples of what I would consider now established invasive species and, and m- more nuisance than anything. Um, there are some natural controls for them. Um, so they're not just going absolutely crazy on the landscape. Uh, they do have their own sort of checks and balances that have kind of come with, with decades of them being established here in Ontario. Um, you know, Japanese beetles have been around oof, since, you know, the 1940s. Um, they're well spread across much of, um, Ontario, Quebec, uh, into the Maritimes. They are, you know, they're pretty ferocious when they get established on your property. They, uh, they are generalists in a way. They will eat, um, and attack uh, more than 250 host plants. Um, some of those would be like your almond and maple trees. They like grapevines. They like fruit trees. Uh, they'll go after certain vegetables, um, mostly asparagus and soybean, blueberries and corn crops. Uh, they really like roses. Oh, they um, really like raspberries too. They ate my yes. bushes down to the canes this year. Yes. So they, you know, if you have any of those sort of things on your property that, that you, you should be looking at your plants on a regular basis because once a population starts to build in your neighborhood, it can be really, really frustrating. Um, and, you know, really control for them is, is challenging. It's labor intensive. Um, you know, short of getting a company out to come and spray, uh, which not everybody likes that idea uh you really need to just hand pick uh beetles off of your plants and put them in soapy water and the same would be a would apply to spongy moth caterpillars as well so there's a lot of labor involved in trying to keep uh some of your plants and trees uh healthy and safe from these two insects um but yeah because they're sort of here birds have have learned or other predators like squirrels and chipmunks have learned to, to eat them so that helps um but yeah, the, those would be that would be two examples of um, ones that we're not going to see disappear anytime soon. Um, but there are some species of, of uh, insect and diseases that I was hoping to speak to um, because they're not yet known to be in your region, and and I think I'd like to keep it that way. Yes, but how do you do that? I mean, if they're flying in the air, if they're on the back of a bird or whatever, what? How do you keep those bugs from getting here? <laughs> yeah, it's it is uh, essentially impossible, unfortunately. But I think where when I'm you know when I work in my field of invasive species, I'm always pushing for awareness. So educating people on what to look for, because early detection is huge when it comes to invasive species and preventing their spread, preventing their establishment. Um, We have good news stories like Asian longhorn beetle where, you know, you can get on something fast enough, you can eradicate it and buy yourself more time without that being 
that pest being on the landscape. So, um, yeah, again, it, it, it's really about awareness. So a couple species that are sort of knocking on our door, if you will, um, and were just recently um, discovered in Ontario would be hemlock woolly adelgid and oak wilt. So hemlock woolly adelgid is an aphid-like insect, and it comes from Japan. Um, it was first uh, detected in, I think it was New York potentially. Anyway, the n- northeast uh, United States, um, and it's been spreading through the Appalachians um, with attacking eastern hemlock trees um, for a number of years now. And unfortunately, we've had a a few new finds here in Ontario, with the most recent being in the Hamilton area this past summer. So, um, and then closest to York region would be the Grafton find, which is just sort of near the Co- Coburg area. So we're kind of flanked a little bit, which is, you know, disconcerting for sure. Um, but we've been doing monitoring in the York Regional Forest. Um, the lead agents, government agency, which is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, has been doing surveys around the province um, because the hope is that uh, you could potentially destroy uh, infected trees and contain this pest from spreading um, if you get on it early enough. Now, will there be the cooperation of all of these different um, communities to do just that? I think it depends on on the site and how how much this pest continues to spread, frankly, in the province. Um, there is a sort of a line that I'm not aware of, but there is sort of a tipping point where if something just keeps popping up um, in more and more sites, it's going to be less and less uh, realistic to contain or eradicate. So it then switches from that um, to more so control and management. Mm. Well, isn't that kind of what happened with the emerald ash borer is that it's just, it just got out of control and uh, so many of the ash trees are dead. There's some people who say they'll never come back. They'll be long gone in Ontario. Yeah, that's, so that is a good example of, um, you know, we thought, and I say we collectively, the government, um, but it was really the, this Canadian Food Inspection Agency was the lead agency. Initially, when emerald ash borer was detected in Michigan and it was, um, you know, coming across the border essentially into Ontario, there was this thought that, you know, maybe we could cut a giant swath um, removing ash trees because it was the sole source, um, sole host tree rather for emerald ash borer. So if we removed all the ash in this sort of line across the landscape, then maybe that would help contain emerald ash borer. But it's the, it was the science wasn't quite up to speed with, with how quickly the pest was spreading. And so they didn't, they weren't aware that they could fly up to 10 kilometers. So it was really just, it, it didn't work, obviously. Um, and as a result, we've lost millions of, of beautiful ash trees across uh, York region. Um, and uh, it has been very devastating, especially for any landowners that have had any big ash trees. The expense um, associated with having to get that tree removed or trees removed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's still being felt, definitely, and I understand that. But I would say on the positive, even in the York Regional Forest, we're seeing a lot of regeneration of ash, thankfully. Um, oh, that's so good ash news. Is still, yeah, ash is still a component of the forest, and that was really what we were hoping for. And, and we um, kept a lot of our big seed source trees for that reason, because we were hoping to keep them alive as sort of that initial really bad infestation wave went through your region and so um yeah and there's you know now there's biological controls for emerald ash borer um even again natural controls like woodpeckers and other things have learned to start feeding on them so we're hoping that you know with with time we will start to see some big ash back on the landscape yay that's good news actually (laughs) yes it is it is so the Um, hemlock woolly adelgate what a crazy yeah. name. I know. <laughs> the hemlock bug. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it going to do the same thing or potentially the same thing yeah. as the emerald ash borer? Yes, but it's on a slower scale, thankfully. So this aphid-like insect is really tiny. It's about the size of a sesame seed. Wow. Um, and so you're not going to see it necessarily. This is the unfortunate thing. Um, it's not as showy and visible as emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle. 
So really what uh, landowners and residents might notice first is is dead dead or dying hemlocks. Um, so it's going to be once those aphid-like insects start feeding on the, the needles of the trees, causing them to start to decline or die, is uh, what we'll probably see first. So we are asking um, residents to learn for to learn what these signs and symptoms look like and to report them to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency because that is going to help us understand where populations of this insect are popping up. Now, how this insect spreads is they are flightless. They actually, thankfully, but they have uh, teamed up with our birds. And so birds will land on um, infected trees uh, and then these little aphid insects will actually hitch a ride on the bodies or the feet of birds and we can't stop our birds from flying so unfortunately they are going to help uh, with this insect spread and then of course too birds often land on the very tops of some of the tallest trees in the forest uh, or on the landscape and that's sort of where the insects are going to become established and start doing what they do and we're not going to really see the tops of these trees until we are starting to see dead branches maybe on the ground. So again, we're just really trying to increase the uh, profile of this particular pest because it's going to be really hard to detect um, initially. But uh, thankfully, they because they're flightless and, and also um, the way that they feed and ultimately start killing the hemlock trees is it is a bit of a slow burn, if you will. So with emerald ash borer, uh, a big, beautiful ash tree could be killed in under a couple years, depending on the level of infestation. Whereas with hemlock, we're starting to see that, you know, it could take 5, 10, 15 years for a hemlock tree to die. So it, it does, you know, give us a bit more time to come up with management and control options for this pest. Hmm. So what about this oak wilt? Oak trees are beautiful. I don't want anything to happen to them. Uh I know. Uh, Mind yes, you, I sadly, say that about every tree. <laughs> yeah, sadly, oak wilt um, is is definitely going to be threatening future oaks on our landscape, and it does uh, impact all oak species. It seems to actually um, attack and kill red oaks much faster than white oaks. Um, but uh, what oak wilt is is it's not a insect; it's actually a fungus, hmm. um, and it's been uh, known since the 1940s, actually. It was first sort of recorded and discovered in, in the 1940s in Wisconsin, and it's been spreading ever since throughout much of the United States. And now uh, we've just had our first formal finds of oak wilt, positive finds of oak wilt in Ontario this past summer. Mm-hmm. Um, the first uh, find was actually the city of Niagara Falls. It was on private property. Somebody um, had big, beautiful oak trees, three of them, standing dead. They knew that uh, they needed to have them removed by an arborist, so they called a tree care company. And thankfully, that arborist was aware of oak wilt signs, and they thought it looked pretty suspicious, and they contacted the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and they came out, um, and they tested it, and it tested positive for oak wilt. Mm. And so they removed those trees, they uh, disposed of them, there was a quite a big operation actually to contain um, and prevent any contamination of equipment and people uh, to keep the oak wilt fungus on that site um, and then to dispose of everything uh, appropriately. Uh, And then they also did what they call a delimitation survey. So that's like, okay, well, if this is ground zero, then how far out might we see infected oaks from here? So they did undertook that survey, thankfully didn't find any more infected oaks. Um, uh, destroyed the stumps, ground the stumps below the ground, covered it with soil and seed, and you would almost know that nothing was there. Mm. Um, and so now, you know, they're going to continue to monitor, um, but we're hoping for a good news story in that we could say that it's been eradicated um, in this location. Uh, but what the fungus does, I should probably explain, is that um, the fungus, it, it attacks the uh, living tissue that's responsible for moving uh, the water and nutrients below the bark in a, tr- in a tree stem and circulatory system. And what happens is when this fungus is spreading, uh, it's sort of setting off warning bells for the tree and the tree knows something's wrong. So it's starting to, it tries to wall off the infection. And so the death 
uh, the ultimate death of the tree is actually done to itself, unfortunately, because it's trying to protect itself. But um, what it's actually doing is cutting off its own source of water and nutrients. And so the tree's leaves start to brown um, and they will quite rapidly start falling off the tree. And one thing with oaks is that they hold onto their leaves. One of the, They're one of the tree species that hold onto their leaves the longest mm-hmm. as we go into the fall. Yeah. But you'll see an infected oak tree start losing their trees on mass or leaves rather on mass in like July. And that's not normal. Wow. So that's one of the biggest signs that your tree might have oak wilt is if you start to find a lot of oak leaves on the ground in the middle of the summer. Huh. And then at that point, you could call the Canadian Food Inspection Agency? Correct. And I knew this question was going to come up because it is <laughs> it is always seems like an odd pairing. But the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is the federal government, is the lead agency responsible for plant health across the plant, up across um, the nation. So, yeah, it is unusual because I don't eat oak. <laughs> right. Well, we don't, but but yeah, there's lots of industry that obviously um, needs oak. Um, you know, forestry is a huge one. Right. Um, but because the, it is a plant health related uh, issue, it is under their mandate through the Plant Protection Act, Plant Health Protection Act, I think it's called. Hmm. So yeah, so they're the lead agency. And so right now, they're the ones that kind of uh, choose what what pests and diseases need to be regulated and how to contain them and things like that. They come up with regulated areas and they um, have all these, you know, different processes that they follow. But oak wilt is on is one of their species that they're mandated to um to regulate and monitor for. And when a f- new find, such as what happened in the city of Niagara Falls this past summer, they kind of helped take the lead in terms of what needs to be done to try and contain the, the spread of this pest or pathogen. Wow. Well, it sounds like you have a really interesting job, albeit not the most positive one on the best of days. But, I mean, it's fascinating. It's to me, it's just fascinating. They are like aliens because these things are not supposed to be here. Obviously, they're supposed to be on Earth, but just not in this part of the Earth. And they can become so strong because they don't have any of their natural predators around to stop them. Exactly. Yep. And again, it's humans traveling here, there, and everywhere. And um, I know New Zealand has really strict rules about bringing your hiking shoes in you have to have them all disinfected and everything in case you're bringing in microorganisms or seeds or anything on your boots yeah i wish uh, some days i wish our our government or or everywhere was like that i mean i've had firsthand i've traveled to new zealand and had my camping gear and everything um taken apart and disinfected at the airport it's quite rigorous it's you know quite effective um and they're trying to protect their natural resources. They are a small set of islands, so they uh, they definitely are protecting their natural resources that way. I think it's harder for a country when you're not an island, such as Canada, um, when you have, you know, abutting neighbors that, you know, mm-hmm. it, whatever happens in that country is ultimately going to is ultimately going to impact your country. So it's a bit it's a bit more challenging for us here in Canada, for sure. Um and yeah, invasive species are definitely spread not just from country to country or continent to continent by humans, but once, you know, established here in Ontario, for instance, um, it doesn't help when people move, uh, you know, garden plants or firewood, mm-hmm. say, from their, you know, GTA home up to their cottage in Muskoka or um, Halliburton Highlands or something like that. So we're you know, we're spreading it even just within our own province um, and making things worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And again, if you don't know, you don't know. I saw people bringing wood up to Halliburton a couple of years ago during the pandemic. And I just said, hey, you can't do that. That's illegal. What if you're bringing a bug from the city that doesn't exist in Halliburton in your firewood? Oh, that's nonsense. What are you talking about? Anyway, I, when I yeah. showed them what the fines were for doing such an act, they were shocked. Mm-hmm. They had no idea. Mm-hmm. So tell us yeah. about this spotted lanternfly, because we're running out of time. We could probably talk on this subject for another three or four shows, which we will do again in the spring. But for now, spotted lanternfly. It doesn't sound yes. good. 
Well, it's funny because people, I guess if you're not completely grossed out by bugs, people will think <laughs> it's, actually, it's, it's a pretty bug, if, if that means anything to you. But um, yeah, so it's a, it's a uh, leaf hopping bug. Um, it looks like a moth, but it's not. Um, it's formerly a leaf hopper. Uh, it's very pretty. It's pinky gray with polka dots, and then it's got this bright red body underneath. Hmm. Um, and it's uh, been brewing in the northeastern states again. Poor northeastern states; they get hit pretty hard too. Um, but they they've been struggling with spotted lanternfly. Spotted lanternfly is um, it it feeds on um, a few different tree species. Uh, but it particularly loves grapevines and fruit trees, which is a really bad combination for, uh, let's say, the Niagara region. Mm-hmm. So if you like to uh, to enjoy a glass of vino, this, uh, this pest is something that you definitely do not want to show up here in Ontario. Um, because, yeah, it, uh, it will severely defoliate uh grapevines and thus um be a pretty big damaging uh crop damaging insect for our wine industry but also our tender fruit and horticulture industries um essentially we do not have it considered established here in ontario yet however i will say that we did have two reports uh submitted to the canadian food inspection agency one in oakville and one in pelham Mm. just like a couple months ago of alive adults single adults but alive um and so the canadian food inspection agency uh went to check out these sites to see if they could find proof of these adults because only in one instant i think it was the pelham find that did they keep it contained whereas the other one the person just simply took a picture of this cool looking bug and sent it to his girlfriend who happened to be more aware of what spotted lanternfly is and was like did you catch it? You know, and he didn't. So it was still on the loose, let's say. Uh, but the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, they did quite a survey at both these locations and couldn't locate any more um, individuals. So at this point, they're not willing to say that it's uh, established in Ontario. Um, but we're, we're having these close calls, if you will. So not good. Um, mm. but yeah, I highly encourage people to Google spotted lanternfly to have a look, uh, for themselves at just how interesting this bug is. Uh, and yeah, essentially, if you see anything that looks remotely like it, uh, we want you to catch it and report it. Um, and hopefully we can keep this one in control. Well, that would be the, the goal, wouldn't it? Although, as you said, it's almost impossible. Yeah, it's, uh, insects. Uh, and pathogens are probably the hardest ones to try and contain. Plants, a little bit more manageable. They don't move about as much. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely invasive species are a challenge. They certainly are. But there is hope. We've, you know, had some interesting um, reports on, like you were saying, the emerald ash borer. Boy, I thought that that was a done deal. We were going to be out of ash trees forever, just like the Dutch elm and things like that. But... It looks like you're saying that they could potentially reclaim their space, so to speak. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Well, on that happy note, we're going to thank you very much for coming on to Fresh Waves today. Um, we hope that everyone has enjoyed the show. If they would like to find out more information, how do they get more information about invasive species and or native plants that they can put in their garden so that they're actually contributing in a positive way to the environment around them? Yes. So I did mention earlier some of our great partners in the invasive species realm. Um, the Invasive Species Centre honestly has a fantastic website full of fact sheets and resources on all these different uh, pests and, and pathogens and plants. Um, so check them out. Uh, our partners at the Ontario Invasive Plant Council um, have a fantastic Grow Me Instead guide. Oh, uh, nice. That, yeah, you should check it out. You can download the PDF um, if you want. Uh, but it's a fantastic guide that shows you some of the most unwanted horticultural popular garden plants and what to, so what ones to avoid. And then they actually give you alternatives to plants. So if you're looking for a, a particular type of ground cover, they have 
um, suggestions for you. If you're looking for shrubs, they have suggestions for you. If you're looking for wildflowers, they have suggestions for you. It's really fantastic resource. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning, Dana. And um, we've learned a lot and we hope to be talking to you again in the spring uh, about some more issues and some more tips for people who are planting their gardens. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for Fresh Waves today. If you'd like to hear any more of the Fresh Waves shows, you can go to our YouTube channel, Fresh Waves Radio, and we'll catch you again next week on Fresh Waves.